Yeah, this is a great Mother's Day for us, that's for sure. We got a new baby in the house. That's pretty good, huh? Yes, yes, yes. So everybody, my daughter's sitting over there. Wave, Amy, and Matt, and Reagan, wave. And you make sure if you see them. So, you know, this is first time grandparenting thing. And they say that it's different. You know, they say that it's special. They say that it's cool. And so I'm learning about that. And so far, I will testify, this is church, right, that that is true, that this is a very cool time. It's a very cool thing. So, um, so, so welcome them and say hi to them again. Um, we are in the middle of a um, relationship series. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to carry on that. Oh, my attire. My attire. I definitely wanted to address my attire. First of all, my shirt. You like my shirt? My wife picked it out. She, um, cause, cause I, it's hard for me to get in the closet. So she picked it out and she threw it on the bed and she was, that's the one. And, and I go, oh, really? I wanted to wear a tie, but I wanted to wear a tie. It's Mother's Day. And she said, so no, no tie. She said, she said, there'll be lots of people with ties and they're good. And that's good. But for those, all those who aren't wearing ties, says, you'll make them feel more comfortable. So, so, so there you go. For all of us not wearing ties, that's good, you know, we're all feeling more comfortable now, so there you go, so, and my, my special boot, my special attire, you know, cowboy boots used to be the in thing, just so you know, but not no more, <laughs> nowadays, it's the big black boot, maybe you hadn't heard that yet, but that's, that is the case, and there's mine, I, for those of you who don't know, I ruptured my Achilles a little over four weeks ago, and I'm on the mend, so I'm doing well, I'm starting to hobble around, and it'll keep getting better, so that's all good. Mother's Day is all about relationships. That's right. That's for sure. Mother's Day is mothers are one of the greatest relationships. It was one of God's best ideas. And um, Mother's Day are all about relationships. But in motherhood, there's lots we have to learn. And there's lots of um, trial along the way. And I, and I, I, I really appreciate Doug's um, prayer and thinking through you know, the struggles that I know motherhood, all relationships brings. But in particular today, motherhood. I, um, I did run, run across a piece of humor that made me laugh. Should I share it with you? Sure. I think I shall. <clears throat> Three sons, it's a Mother's Day humor. Three sons left home um, and went out on their own and prospered greatly. And um, getting back together, they discussed the gifts that they were bringing to their elderly mother. The first said, well, I built mom this great big house. Can you imagine? He built his mom a house, and that was, that was good. The second son said, well, I got that beat. I got mom a brand new Mercedes and a driver, a personal driver for life. Pretty cool. The, the, the third son said, well, I've got you both beat. He says, you know how mom enjoys the Bible, and you know she can't see very, very well anymore, so I sent her a brown parrot, a brown parrot that can recite the entire Bible. See, it took 20 monks and a monastery 12 years to train this parrot to recite the Bible. All she has to do is, is say the, the, the verse and the, the, the chapter and verse and the parrot. She just recites the whole thing. So, and he goes, I got you all beat. That was really good. Right. Soon thereafter, mom sent out her thank you cards to the sons. Oh, to, her, to her first son. His name was Milton. She wrote, the house you built is too large. I, I only stay in one room and have to clean the whole thing. To her second son, she says, Marvin, I am too old to travel. You know that. I stay home all the time, so I never use the Mercedes and that driver. He's so rude. And, the, and she wrote to her third son, dearest Melvin, you were the only son to have the good sense to know what your mother likes. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> okay. I laughed when I read it too, so that's good. You laughed. That's good. Right on cue. So it's a good joke. Current series, You Make Me Crazy. It's all about relationships. As I was thinking through Mother's Day and I was thinking through relationships, I thought, I was trying to think, think through Bible motherly relationships, and I thought of... Jesus. And I thought of Jesus' mom. And, you know, that first observation, the first thing I, I thought about was, can you imagine 
being Jesus' mom. Can you imagine being Jesus' mother? Look what the scripture said. This is from John. It's in your planners. Everyone pull out that white paper in the middle of your planner, and, and the notes are there. Can you imagine being Jesus' mom? Look what he, John says in verse 19, verse 26, 27. Now, this is Jesus. He is he's on the cross. Get this. He's on the cross when he says these things to his mom. And so let's take some insights. Let's look at this and what, what he says. He says, when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loves. So he's on the cross. He's looking down. He sees John, the disciple he loves, standing next to his mom. And you can imagine, if you're a mom, I don't care who you are, you can imagine what's going through her mind right now. Or you might not want to. It's Mother's Day. But it wouldn't have been good. As she, she, He saw them standing there. He said to her, dear woman, here's your son. And he said to this disciple, here, so he said to her, look at Mary, here is your mother. So right then, he's conveying sonship from, from his mother to John. Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. So here's Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world. You know, thinking, thinking globally, you know, thinking about all this. And yet, Jesus at the same moment... Dying for you and me and for all eternity at that same moment. He has time to think and he does think about caring for his mother in her elderly age and throughout her life. He said, John, okay, I'm done. This is it. You know, I'm not going to be around no more. So, John, you're it. Tag, you got mom. Right? Jesus on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, taking care of his mother at the same time. Wow. Wow. Two observations from Mary's point of view. From Mary's point of view. Motherhood observations. One, motherhooding is frustrating and heartbreaking. Right? Your moms? And I think it's true. You know, I'm saying this for moms today. I think, guys, we can all relate, you know, living. But moms, and here's Mary. You know, you, can you imagine being Mary looking up? At Jesus, nothing she could do. Frustrating. And of course, broken hearted. Broken hearted. And in this world of relationships, the most important thing we need to be about is caring for those relationships one with another and caring for our relationship with God if we want to be healthy. So I want to give you, to start with here, I want to give you seven practical ways. To, um, to build your relationships here on earth. To, and I'm going to use mom as an example. Seven practical ways to build relationships with mom. How to love mom. Here's, you know, what did I title the message? Seven ways to love your mom. <laughs> so here's seven practical ways to love your mom and to help alleviate. You know, in this life, in this side of eternity, we are not going to completely alleviate frustrations. We are not going to completely alleviate heartbreak. But we can do our part to, to make it less. To make it less. So here's seven practical ways. I'll go through them fairly quickly. One, love her verbally. Love her verbally. Men especially. What's the word that men like to say? Well, you know, I love her, but, you know, I don't really like to say those things. I don't really say those things much. Or, you know, I don't have to say I love you. I said it before. I said it last week. And, if, you know, if I change my mind, I'll, I'll make sure to tell you. Right? Isn't that the kind of things that, that guys like to say? But, but that's, not, that's not good enough. Guys, if that's the way you think, and people, if that's the way you think, um, you need to change. You need to, you need to be about expressing while you can encouraging words to the ones you love. The scripture, Proverbs 31, talking about this woman. It says, her children rise up and what? And call her. I circled call her. Call her what? blessed her husband also and he praises her those are encouraging physical tangible words children parents sons daughters we need about encouraging one another here's a dear abby letter i, I read this week and it and it and it touched me dear abby said this you know that it's, it's old it says i enlisted shortly after pearl harbor 36 days later i was on my way to the philippines in route to the philippines I felt, um, Philip, um, 
The Philippines fell to the Japanese and we were routed to Australia. 11 days after we landed, I met the most beautiful girl in the world. On our first date, I told her I was going to marry her, and I did 18 months later, while on a 10-day R&R leave from New Guinea. After more than 57 years of marriage and two children, my beloved Mary died five days before Christmas. Although we agreed that our ashes were to be scattered over the mountains, I found I I could I could not part with her while Mary was alive she would frequently say you don't know how much I love you and I'd reply likewise I never said to her I love you now her ashes are on my dresser where I tell her several times every day how much I love her but it's too late although I wrote poetry to her I could never bring myself to say the three words I knew she wanted to hear most so as my dearest was dying, and we thought was in a coma, I told her, there aren't enough words to tell you how much I love you. A few hours later, she whispered, not enough words, and died. The reason I'm writing is to urge men especially to express their feelings while their loved ones are still alive. I don't know why, but many men are reluctant to express the depths of their feelings. And it was signed, Missing Mary in Colorado. Men, people, I don't care the way you think you're wired. Why you can express your love, your affection, your dearest, especially to mom, but to everybody. And so I, I've already did it privately and I will do it publicly. Mom, I love my mom sitting where? She's somewhere over there. Mom, I love you. Thank you for being my mom. And you're a great mom. And number two, number two, love her physically. Love her physically. Um, dear children, 1 John 3.18, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech only, but with actions and in truth. It is true. I, I, um, I picked up, and I, just to remind myself how important physical touch is, and I reread um, chapter 8 of the great book by Gary Chapman. I highly recommend it to everyone. The five love languages in chapter eight is the fifth love language is physical touch. We are created as human beings to need physical interaction and physical touch. It encourages us. Remember when, when maybe you were little and your, your grandma would, would come or your, or, your, or your mom or whatever and they'd say, come give me sugars, honey, right? Remember that? And you'd have to go over there and maybe you didn't want to, you were little... But you'd have to go over there and you'd have to give them smooches and hugs and kisses because they, what did they want? They wanted physical affection, physical touch. And so at, when you're three, they can actually flat out ask you for it. You know, they don't have to wait and you got to go do what they say. That's part of the deal of being, you know, grandma and mom and you being free. So, um, so give them sugars when they ask for it. And it's important to, today, hug your mom, you know, husbands. Hug and take care of your wives. Show them physical attention as well. Number three, love her patiently. Love her patiently. The love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 says, Love is patient and kind. Mothers have an incredible job that seems to never be filled, right? They they, they, they sew, they clean, they wash, they take care of us, they serve us, they put their agendas on hold so that they can meet our needs. And yet there's no pay and very often no gratitude. We'll get to gratitude in a minute, but no gratitude. So be patient with your moms. Take them, um, don't take them for granted. Who here has been impatient you know, with your moms? We have at times and we, we shouldn't do that. Here's a, a poem I found called No Occupation, and, and I like it. It says, she rises up at break of day, and through her tasks she races. She cooks the meals as best she may, and scrubs the children's faces. While school books, lunches, homework too, all need consideration, and yet the census man insists she has no occupation. When breakfast dishes all are done, she bakes the pudding, maybe, she cleans the room up one by one with one eye-watching baby. 
the mending pile she then attacks and by way of variation and yet the census man insists that she has no occupation she irons for a little while then presses pants for daddy she welcomes with a cheery smile returning lass and laddie a hearty dinner next she cooks no time for relaxation and yet the census man he insists errantly that i put in she has no occupation don't ever take mom for granted keep on that theme a little bit and don't ever make the mistake of um of, of being um, impatient with your mom love her patiently number four love her attentively attentively be present be present i wrote that after attentively month be present um this is the one, you know, on, on all these, I'd encourage you as I go through this list, find one that you need to particularly do, and it particularly speaks to you, and then circle it. This is the one that's circled on mine. <laughs> Love her attentively. How often, I'll talk to men, men, how often are we distracted by seemingly what seems to be the, most, the more important things in our lives, whether it be work or golf or TV or whatever, and we are not attentive to the needs or wants of our wives or our moms. Ouch. Attentiveness. Um, it is the most, to me, you know, it's the one that hit home. Attentiveness, the, the definition of showing the worth of a person or task by giving my undivided concentration my undivided concentration if you've been guilty you're watching sports you're watching the giants whatever and your wife says something and you go and it kind of goes in one ear and out the other anyone else been there besides me maybe once or twice you know so um you know you know put first things first in your family and your relationships and especially guys your wives you know you got to make sure that that is important listen my sons to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teachings, you know, listen. What's the first word? I circled the word listen. I circled listen, and then I circled the word do not forsake on my outline. So listen, pay attention, and, um, and be attentive to your wife and to your mom. Five, love her gratefully. Love her gratefully. Your mom would say this, to you. Your mom would say this, I have no greater joy, look at the scripture says in, in, in 3 John, I have no greater joy than to hear my children say, than to hold my children are walking in the truth. Sorry, I blew that. I have no greater joy than to, to hear my children, that hear that my children are walking in the truth. I don't know why I keep wanting to say it. Okay. Love her gratefully. Be grateful. Be grateful. Show attention and be grateful to your mom. How many of you have, um, have recently brought something home to show gratitude to your wives? Maybe flowers. It's mothers who are shown gratitude to your mom by bringing something home. This morning I brought my, mo my wife, my, my mom, oh, my mom, a gardenia corsage. I wouldn't want to bring it to my wife. My wife doesn't like the smell of gardenias. It makes her sneeze. But I, I gave my, my, my mom a gardenia corsage, a, a, a thank you, gratitude. But be grateful to, to yours, to your, to your, um, to your, to those you love. An, an elementary science class had been studying magnets and how metals attract each other. And at the end of the semester, the teacher put on the exam this question. Um, it's a six-letter word that begins with N, M, that picks things up, that picks things up. Over half the cat class didn't write the word magnet. They wrote mother. <laughs> so your wives and your moms you know, they pick up around you, they clean around you, they take care of you, and we need to be grateful and physically and emotionally and be a words, be grateful to them. And so I really wanted to bring this home, and so I've got this really cool video I found, which I think brings it home. Zach, you got it? Watch this. I pulled the chemistry lab. <laughs> no, you did not. not. Mm -hmm. 
That's a long story. Not okay. <laughs> How was choir? It was good. Moms have it so easy. I mean, their lives are fun, simple, and, and so rewarding. <laughs> Sometimes I wish, instead of being the dad, I, I wish I was the mom. Ah, oh, another day of pedicures, reading my magazines, and making myself beautiful. <laughs> this is the life. Mom? Mom, tell him to stop copying me. Mom, tell him to stop copying me. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Mom, do something. Mom, do something. Are you serious? Are you serious? Mom, are you serious? Why did I ever ask you to help me? <laughs> I should have known you couldn't fix my hair. I look like a freak. Look at me. Look at me. Hey, Mom, look at this. Look at me. Come on, Mom, look at me. Watch this, Mom. Come on, look at this. Watch this. Come on, look at me. Come on, Mom. Look at me. Come on, Mom. Look at me. Come on. Mom, I have a book report due tomorrow and I haven't read any of this. Mom, if you don't help me, I'm going to fail school and be a loser forever. <laughs> you don't expect me to read this all by myself, oh, Lord, do peace. you? You don't expect me to eat this, do you? Seriously, Mom, what is this? Mom, I'm not going to eat this. Dad, can we just go out to eat, please? Hey kids, be nice to your mother. <laughs> if I eat this, I'm gonna throw up. Mom, I said I'm gonna throw up. No! <laughs> Mom, I think I'm gonna be sick too. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> no, seriously. I don't know how you do it. I, I, I'm at a loss for words. Kids, come here, get in here, hug your mother. Tell her you love her. We're in the presence of greatness. <laughs> Not now, dad's on a roll. This is God's greatest creation, kids. You're smooshing my face. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry, because I don't say thank you enough. I mean, the truth is, I don't deserve you. We don't deserve you. And one day is, is not enough to honor you. We, we should honor you every day. But how do we say thank you to the woman that means the world to us? I know. We're going to go right now and get you that vacuum cleaner you've had your eye on. <laughs> no, no. Shh, 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 shh. Don't speak. Don't speak. This time, we're going name brand, baby. Name brand. Come on, kids. Let's go make your mom's dreams come true. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! So be grateful for your moms. God created these amazing two words. They're thank you. And you need to use them more often. Write them down. Thank you, mom. Thank you, my beloved wife. You know, be thankful to those relationships in your life that mean the world to you. All right. Six, and love her generously. Love her generously. Give. Give generously. Give of your time. Give of your talents, you know, give generously. And the thing that moms want most isn't stuff, right? The things that the moms, the things that your wives want most isn't more stuff. What they want is you. They want your attention. They want your, your care. They want your, 
you to be present. That's what they want. So, so, so love her generously. Um, I, I love this little math quiz. You know, math question. State your answer as a fraction. If there are 10 at the table and an apple pie, and your mom's there and she's dishing out, how much does each one get? Someone's smart. Yeah, it's not 10, it's 9. Because if there's 10 people at the table and your mom's dishing it out, of course, she's not going to take one for herself. So there, everybody gets, so there's nine pieces of pie. And so your mom is generous with you. You need to be generous with your time and your talents and all you have back to your mom. And seven, love her honorably. Seven, love her honorably. Scripture, Exodus 20 says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live along, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. Honor, honor, respect. I have disrespected my wife at times and I've disrespected my mother, especially when I was young. But <laughs> and I have disrespected my mother at times. We need to honor and cherish and love and be about giving to the greatest gifts, the greatest relationships that God has put into our lives and not be disrespectful and not be putting them as second fiddles and not be taking them for granted. And I, you know, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I think everyone in the room is with me. Everyone in the room male and female, guys and gals, you're all with me at one point or another. We need to be about cultivating the relationships, honoring, respecting the relationships that God has placed in our lives in such a way as we, uh, we, we, we alleviate, we, we help lessen the frustrations and the heartache that is inevitable in, in, in relationships today. All right, I want to end with a, um, with a story, a Bible story. It's on the bottom of your planner there. And it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a great story of Hannah and her husband, Elhana. Elhana. Uh, Hannah and Elhana. Hannah um, was the wife of Elhana. Elhana um, was the husband of Hannah. <laughs> they, um, they, uh, Hannah was barren. She couldn't have children. And, um, and she was heartsick. She was heartbroken over this fact that she couldn't have children. Um, and partially because of this, partially because it was cultural, Elkanah had actually had two wives. He had Hannah, and he had another wife named Penina. Now, Penina had him lots of children. Had him lots of children. So there's several things, you know, that we learn from this. One is, is um, that Elkanah must have been a very, very wealthy man. Um, I know, you know, my, I know what it's like, you know, having one wife, and um, so I can, um, I can just imagine, you know, Elhana, he had two, and so he must have been a very, he was a very ha happy, wealthy man, Elhana was. He had two wives, Hannah and Penina, and Penina bore him children, and Hannah didn't. So let's pick it up there in verse 4, in, in 1 Samuel um, chapter 1, verse, verse, verses 4 through 8, says, Whenever the day came for, for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, that would have been Penina, right? Kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord. Her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? First Samuel 4. 1 Samuel 1, verses 4 through 8. 
Okay, so you, you got this. So you got, you got El, 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 Elkanah, and he's trying to make Hannah happy. He, 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 the, the scripture says he loves Hannah, and it appears he loves Hannah. It appears more than, more than Penina, because he gave, he gave Hannah a double portion of meat. So that means he loves her more than, than, than Penina. And no matter what El, Elkanah did, it seemed that Hannah was sad. It seemed that she was heartbroken. It seemed that there was nothing that he could do to, to, to ease her, her broken heart of, over not having children. So let's look at this from two points of view. Let's look at Elkanah's point of view, and then we'll look at Hannah's point of view. So Elkanah's first. So men, by nature, we are fixers. Right? We are fixers, and, and, and what we try to do is we try to fix things. We try to put things in order. We get great satisfaction in putting things that are broken, and we fix them. And we try to do that with relationships as well. My wife would tell you that I am not a good fixer. <laughs> you know, I have a tool belt, but it doesn't really work. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of known for, for starting things and getting them, don't laugh, Mike, getting them half done and them staying half done. So I'm not a great fixer. And in relationships, you know, we, need, we do the same thing, though. We, 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 try to, we try to fix things. And how many of you know that that can be frustrating? It's frustrating to be a fixer and yet not be able to, to fix the things that you're trying to, to fix. And, um, and I, I, I think that that's what's going on here in 1 Samuel, Elkanah is frustrated because he's trying to fix Hannah. He gave her a double portion of meat. You know, he was taking care of her. He's trying to fix her. And no matter what he did, how Hannah was sad. And she would, she would cry and she would just stay in bed all morning and wouldn't get up. And, and it was just, she was, she was very, very frustrated. And he was very frustrated from not being able to fix her. And Elkanah, like guys do, he took it as a personal indictment about himself, about his, not, his ability not being able to fix her. It was an indictment about his personhood, about his manhood. Men wrap up their, their security and, and, and they, they wrap up their success in their ability to fix, especially the things that they love most in this world and to provide for those ones that they love most in the world. And Elkanah, he was a frustrated fixer, I call him. He was a frustrated fixer. He tried everything he could to fix Hannah, and he couldn't. He said, you know, I've given you all the meat. I'm giving you, you know, big three-inch. I took you to Morton's. You know, I gave you the three-inch fillets. I gave you the New York's, and the, I gave you the porterhouse steaks, and I gave you, you know, lots of chicken and sausage and lamb and everything, and no matter what I gave you, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. So, from Elkanah's point of view, practical issue number one is, guys, it's not always about you. It's not always about you. You can't always fix everything. There are many things in this life that are beyond and out of our control, and we can't fix them. Word from, word from the Lord for every guy in the room who's a frustrated fixer, that, that God wants his job back. <laughs> you know, God wants his job back. We so often intervene in God's role. We put ourselves in his role by trying to fix the things that, that only God can fix. God's just saying, you know, please, guys, if you would just slow down a little bit and get out of my way, you know, I, I'd have her attention long enough to maybe, you know, intervene a little bit here. Last year, um, someone in my family went through a, a horrific time, probably, I don't know, they'll tell it later, the story in detail, but probably possibly the worst time of their life, a time of, um, of great heartache, a time of great depression, a time of great frustration over life issues. My point is me. What I did as, as a guy is I jumped in, and what do guys do? Fix. I did my very darndest to try to fix the situation to try to, you know, if you only would do these things, if you would only look at it this way, if you would only perceive it from God's point of view, 
And, and to this person's credit, through the whole frustration, through the whole struggle, never turned from the faith that was sustaining them. And in the end, that is what you know, brought them through. But God taught me an, an invaluable lesson through that struggle. Through that struggle. And he taught me that I am only allowed to carry the things that he's given me to carry. I cannot carry another person's burdens. I cannot carry another person's struggles. I cannot, those weights are not mine to own. Those weights are not mine to own. And I learned to trust God even when things are going bad. And everything, you know, in the end, through prayer and through, you know, through lots of stuff, you know, God worked it all out. You know, God worked it all out. But I learned some valuable lessons that God was teaching me through the frustrations of trying to fix, you know, that, you know, there are some things that I just can't fix. Some things I can't fix on my own. When we, when we make ourselves the fixers, we're, well, we're working well above our pay grade. We're working well above our pay grade. We need to remember there are many things that only God can fix. The simple truth in relationships, we try to hold too much, and um, it leads to frustrations. And that was Elkanah, Elkanah's truth that he learned, that it led to frustration in his life. And, and Hannah learned another lesson. Hannah learned. Let's look at Hannah's side now. And I, she learned because she was brokenhearted. She learned how to relieve her brokenheartedness. She was brokenhearted Hannah, I call her. Brokenhearted, broken dreams, broken hopes. Hannah believed that God, this is what Hannah believed at that point, that God was letting her down, that God had let her down, that God had abandoned her, that, that she was alone. There was nothing Elkanah could do to please her. And she, and she, was, she was crazy sad. She was depressed, we would say, in, in our day, right? No matter how much love Elkanah put into Hannah, no matter how much it seemed like it was never enough. No matter how much love he put in, it was never enough. And we can be that way too. Because when our hearts are broken, it seems like no matter how much love and affection and affirmation someone puts into us, it seems like it's never enough. Because when we get our affirmation from other people, we will always be let down. We will always be let, let down. When we become addicted to the affirmation of a people, when we become addicted to the love of a person, we will be let down. We will be let down. Addictions like this, you know what addictions are like, right? When you're addicted, does it work to feed the addiction with more of what we're addicted to? No, it doesn't. If you're addicted to relationships by giving more affirmation, it's like it just runs in one side and runs out the other. If we're addicted to alcohol, if there's someone, a person who's addicted to alcohol, does it work to give them just a little more alcohol to relieve this pain? Is that what we do? No, that's not what we do. What we do is we learn to control and we learn to cure, we learn to alleviate the addiction by finding a true source of, of help for, the, for what is ailing us. And in relationships, in relationships, addiction to affirmation in others is a huge problem, and the solution will never be more affirmation. The solution is to find a different source, a different source that is capable of fulfilling the need, and that is Jesus. Now, let's not get confused. We all need people in our lives. And I'm not talking about that. We all need relationships. We all need people to, to help us through this life. What I'm talking about is when, when, whenever life seems to be, when people seem to be so, when, when we, we use the word needy, right? That, that we can never get enough. We can never get enough affirmation. We can never get enough love. We can, we can never get enough attention from others. And it just seems to run out because that one spot in our life, that, that thing that we need in our life isn't being filled. And that thing is that spiritual void that only God can fill. And we're trying to fill it with other things. And it never, ever will work. Never will work. 
I got an illustration I want to share with you here. I got it. Do you, you can come to the piano too. I'm going to close this up here in just a second. Simple illustration. A hammer and a bottle of water. If I use the hammer to drive in the nail, to drive in the stake, I'm going to be good. It's going to do exactly what it wants. So I get all sweaty and I get all hot and I drink the water to quench my thirst. I'm going to be good because that's exactly what it was created for. But if I try to drink from the hammer, I'm going to be very frustrated. And if I try to nail in the, the nail or the stake with a bottle of water, I'm going to be very frustrated and I'm going to have a mess everywhere. And it's the same thing with the relationships. It's the same thing with human relationships. When we use them as God intended, they fill us. They complete us. They help us. You know, they come alongside and, and relationships, they're a great thing as God intended them. But when we use them, relationships, as God didn't intend them, as we try to fill places in our life, fill needs in our life that God never intended to be filled by another person, when we do that, we will be frustrated and we will be brokenhearted and we will be left lonely and we will be left needing. We'll be left dis disappointed. Here's the truth. People aren't intended to complete you or fulfill you. That place is reserved for God and God alone. God alone completes us. God alone brings health to, to this relationship, which brings health to these relationships. But it must start with that relationship. Hannah needed to bring to God, and, and she didn't, and she was, she was needy at that point. The good news, when Jesus hung on the cross, he filled that need in you, for you and for me, to, to supply, to, to be that bridge to the relationship to the Father, and to be that bridge to the relationships to one another. But it's got to begin with our faith and our relationship with Jesus. We need to surrender back to God the parts that we can't control so we can correctly play the parts in the lives of the people we love that God wants us to control. We need to have, Hannah needs to have a conversation with Elkanah, and we need to have conversations with people in our lives and say, I no longer hold you responsible for the brokenheartedness that is in me. We need to have that conversation. We need to say, I no longer hold you responsible that I've been frustrated trying to fix you. And I recognize that I will never be your fixer. God didn't design me to fix you. God designed me just simply to love you and to come alongside and to care and to walk this life together. And we need to learn that lesson today. Conclusion from Elkanah's point of view. Elkanah said, learn this. He said, when I come to terms that I'm not the fixer, when Elkanah came to terms that he's not the fixer for Hannah, that I become the instrument, I become an instrument of God. I become the healer. I can become a healer in her life. And we stop trying to fix people and allow God. When that happens in our lives, there's less frustration. There's less frustration. And, and Hannah learned the lesson that when she stops trying to bring people into her situation to fix her, that she becomes free. She's actually freed to allow God, the only one who can really fix her in the first place, to, to come in and heal her and fix her and, and, and allow her to, to breathe. and allow them, That allows the people in her life to, to, to come alongside and be what they were intended to be. But it starts with God. It starts with God. It starts with allowing Him to come in and free us enough to be healed by Him, the only one who can really heal us. Final word, eventually, Hannah got her baby. Samuel was born. She got her baby and, um, and then dedicated him back to the Lord. And, and the impressive part isn't the fact that she dedicated him to the Lord. The impressive part was the fact that she dedicated her situation to the Lord even before she knew how it was going to turn out. 
That was the impressive part. And when we learn that lesson, you know, it's a year of trust, right? That is truly what trust is all about. When we commit to the Lord, the struggles, the frustrations, the heartache of this life, that we don't have control over. And we say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you to bring me through the frustration. I trust you with my heartache. I trust you that you're the one who can be the fixer. You're the one who can be the healer. I can't. When we do that, when we get to that place, that, that, is truly trusting in the Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer. And I believe, let me just ask this way. If you sit here today and you'd say, Pastor, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a frustrated fixer. <laughs> you know, guys or gals, you know, I, I tend to try to control things. I tend to try to to put everything in line and put everything in order and I want it to be the way I want it to be and, and I grab my, gra- my gratification from that and my success from that and you know, and I, I, I'm a frustrated fixer and I need help with that. If that's you, maybe you're, maybe you're like Hannah, you're heartbroken over life, heartbroken over the issues of life, heartbroken over things that you can't control and, and you need to give to God and you need to say, You know, it's out of my control, and I need to put my trust in you, Lord. Because I'm heartbroken. And I've tried to I've tried to fix it with people. I've tried to let, you know, but it no matter what I do, seems to run in one side and out the other. If either of those are you, and I believe it's probably most you stand. And I'm gonna pray a prayer for us. I'm standing. I'm gonna pray a prayer for us today. If you're a frustrated fixer. Or if you are a heartbroken hand, stand right now. Stand right now to your feet. And I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us. I believe it is, I believe if you're honest, I believe if you're honest, it's most of us in the room. I I don't know. I've never met a person in my life who didn't have issues that they weren't heartbroken over. I'm not minimizing anyone's that's standing. Anyone who's saying that, you know, I'm not minimizing that. But I'm saying, Whether you're sitting or standing, I want God to speak to you today through this prayer. Moms, happy Mother's Day. God is a great God who loves us more than we can even fathom or emote or believe. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this Mother's Day morning. Thank you for the joy of fellowship of friend and and family. And Lord, we ask today, please, take your job back. Lord God, you are the fixer. You are the healer. You are my all in all. I am not. Please fix me. I am broken. Lord God, I'm hurting. I'm lonely. Fix me. Fill me like only you can. And for every broken-hearted hand in the room, Lord, I pray. Lord, I, I call on you to meet my needs like only you can, to heal my heart, like only you can. I release my expectations of others to fulfill me, and I receive your love that meets my every need. And I acknowledge, Lord God, this morning, I put my trust in you. I put my whole trust in you. And I give you thanks. I give you praise. We give you honor. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks for joining with us today in our live streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.